Good morning, everybody. Good evening for George. Here is a, a new IIC, IIA uh, web login. And today we will present the talk by Dr. George Hield from uh, Space, uh, CEO of Space and Astronomy in Australia. And he will talk about revealing cosmic magnetism with the square kilometer array and, his, and its pathfinders. Uh, George will be introduced properly by Dr. Isabel Marquez. Please, Isabel. Hello, everybody. Good morning or evening or whatever, depending on where you are now. And uh, thank you very much for coming um, here again in, in virtual format to our uh, Weblockia uh, system that we have now online for the Severo Chua program in, at the Instituto de Astrofisica Andalucía. It's a pleasure for us to have uh, uh, Dr. George Hield today. Uh, that can be accepted on our invitation. Dr. George Hield received his uh, PhD in 2006 uh, from the University of uh, New Mexico in Albuquerque and uh, with a thesis uh, focused on the kinematics of extraplanar ionized hydrogen in, in nearby spiral galaxies as uh, measured using Fabry Perot and multifiber optical spectroscopy. Uh, then he moved to Astron in the Netherlands, uh, where he extended his research on this hello kinematics and also include neutral hydrogen, in particular uh, by leading the sensitive hello gas survey uh, on the Westerbock Synthesis Radio Telescope. While at Astron, uh, he also gained uh, experience with radio polarimetry and low frequency radio astronomy, uh, leading uh, major parts of the low far low frequency arrays, you know, commissioning program. He moved uh, to where he's now, to Australia in 2016, to take up a prestigious science uh, leader position at uh, uh, CSIRO, Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, uh, which is the Australia's national uh, science agency located in Perth and Western Australia. At CSIRO, he has led the growth of a strong and inclusive research group focused on the SKA and precursor telescopes uh, Marcus on Whitefield Array and uh, ASCAP. Dr. Hield is a, a principal investigator of the um, ASCAP Possum Survey, which uh, means Polarization Sky Survey of the Universe uh, Magnetism, and co uh, he co chairs the SKA Magnetism Science uh, Working Group. Today he's talking uh, about the revealing cosmic magnetism uh, with the SKA. And it's uh, Pathfinder, so it's a pleasure for us to have you here. And I, I hope in the next future uh, we will have an in, in-person meeting with you here at the IAA. Thank you very much. The, the floor is, is yours. Great. Oh, well, thanks very much, Isabel, for that introduction. I appreciate that. And uh, I'd really like to um, thank the organizers of this colloquium series for uh, for supporting me and inviting me to participate, and in particular to Lourdes for um, uh, for for prompting uh, this invitation and for supporting uh, my participation here. So I'm uh, really glad to join you. And uh, I also wish that I could uh, join you in person uh, in Granada, but uh, um, with that not being possible, I'm very happy to talk with you online and uh, hopefully can join you uh, one day in the future. Um, okay, so for this presentation, I what I'd like to do is um, give you an overview of the uh, the the goals that we have um, to study cosmic magnetism with, with the square kilometer array. Um, I'll begin with just a, a very few remarks um, about uh, some of the observational techniques that we use in radio astronomy to trace magnetism. I, I won't go into some of the more gruesome details, don't worry, but uh, just a few reminders about some of the techniques that we use to trace magnetism in different ways. I'll then go through a, a brief summary of um, the headline science goals that we wish to achieve uh, with, with the square kilometer array. And I'll focus for some time on progress that we're making towards those goals uh, with precursors and pathfinders to the SKA. In particular, um, a, a, a range of different science topics which are close to my heart and um, sort of self-selected uh, things that I've been involved in using the Murchison Wide Field Array, uh, the Low Frequency Array, and the Australian SK Pathfinder. Uh, in particular, the Possum project. I'll then go on to describe the observational projects that we plan uh, to do, the, the primary observational project that we wish to, to undertake with the Square Kilometer Array, the so-called RM Grid Survey. I'll come back to what that means later on. And some uh, 
conceptual plans for uh, what we wish to do with the low frequency component of the SK. At the end, uh, uh, if there's time, I'll talk about the commensality um, that we wish to um, that we wish to plan for with other science working groups, and uh, the um, a science data challenge that we're working towards in the scope of magnetism science with the SKA, um, with a particular emphasis on the, some of the data challenges that we focus and, and how um, SKA regional centers will be relevant for our research. And I'll, I'll just acknowledge that a few people um, have uh, contributed some material that I've used in this presentation. Uh, in particular, I'll highlight uh, Valentina Vaca, who's the, uh, the co-chair with me of the um, Magnetism Science Working Group, and Takuya Akahori, who is the, um, the individual who's leading the, um, the work towards the magnetism science data challenge that I'll mention at the end. So with the square kilometer array, we wish to address questions of cosmic magnetism throughout the universe on multiple scales, physical scales. I, I start here with um, by showing you the magnetic field, the distribution of ordered magnetic fields within the grand design spiral galaxy M51. Um, you can see here very clearly the magnetic fields, the ordered magnetic fields following these yellow vectors are very well aligned with the spiral pattern in this galaxy. That's a, um, a, a pattern which is seen commonly in other galaxies. Um, one of the things that we'd like to understand is, you know, understand more about the, the typical structure and properties of galactic magnetic fields, but in particular to understand their relevance in the overall structure kinematics and evolution of, of galaxies. On smaller scales, um, we definitely want to understand the role of magnetism in establishing the conditions of the multi-phase interstellar medium and to, to trace the, uh, the impact of magnetic fields in establishing where and how stars are formed in the ISM. But then on larger scales, we're also interested on magnetism um, on megaparsec scales and beyond. Um, so these individual galaxies reside within the cosmic web, um, and we are, are very keen to understand um, to what extent magnetic fields trace um, this cosmic web structure throughout the universe, and indeed what role magnetic fields might have played in establishing the large scale structure of the universe itself. Um, through this, we, we also are very interested in the interaction between individual galaxies and the large scale structure and the role that magnetic fields play there. Um, so there are multiple surveys that have um, in recent times that have started to probe um, various aspects of all of these questions. Um, one, of the, um, one of the projects which is probing, starting to probe the connection between galaxies and the intergalactic medium is the, the changes survey with the VLA, which I won't talk about very much in this presentation as it, um, um, looking more towards the, um, the uh, the SK precursors in this presentation. Um, but this is a very nice image of the Edge on Galaxy NGC 5775 uh, showing the um, vertical distribution of, of magnetic fields in that galaxy. Now, one thing I wanted to mention right away um, was that we don't have, we can't measure magnetic fields directly. We can only measure magnetic fields indirectly. And in this particular case, uh, what we're seeing is, is synchrotron emission, uh, which is um, emitted by cosmic ray electrons, which are accelerated by um, the magnetic fields in the, in the halo of, of this particular galaxy. And so this is very much like looking at iron filings um, around a bar magnet. Uh, we're using cosmic rays in this case and their synchrotron emission as the, um, as the, uh, the process that illuminates these magnetic fields and shows us um, how they're structured and oriented. So just a bit more about that. Um, synchrotron radiation, um, again, is caused by um, highly relativistic electrons, primarily, uh, which are accelerated by magnetic fields. They emit um, beamed radiation, which we detect with radio telescopes. Um, they help us measure the um, total magnetic field strength um, that, that caused this emission in the first place. Uh, and that emission is also polarized as well. And the polarization is a, a very sensitive tracer of how ordered the magnetic field is in the plane of the sky. If it's tangled, then we don't see very much net polarization. But if the magnetic fields are all pointing in the same direction, uh, then we see a lot of uh, linear polarization uh, from those magnetic fields. 
uh, a very important tracer for us is a, tech, is a, a process called Faraday rotation, uh, which is generated um, or which is imposed on this polarized synchrotron radiation as it um, as it heads towards the observer. As that polarized light goes through the magneto, uh, magnetized ionized medium, that could be in the host galaxy where the emission originated. It could be in the intergalactic medium in between. It could be in our own Milky Way. And it can even be in the ionosphere of the Earth as well. Um, all of these media um, provide the conditions for Faraday rotation, which rotates the, the plane of polarization in a frequency dependent way and gives us um, a, a tracer of the magnetic fields now along the line of sight rather than in the plane of the sky and tells us um, the combination of ionized gas and magnetic field strength along with the direction, overall direction of the magnetic field as well. So this is a very powerful tracer for us, as you'll see. Uh, Faraday rotation, and I want to point this out because it's important later on, Faraday rotation is a great way to distinguish between the ordering of the magnetic fields along the line of sight. Um, there's two configurations here, um, obviously um, fake configurations of magnetic fields uh, with two different setups. One where the magnetic fields are all pointing in the same direction and one where the magnetic fields are, are quite highly ordered but are not coherent. In other, in other words, they're not all pointing in the same direction. In the left-hand case, we would see a net rotation measure. In this case, negative, because the magnetic field is pointing away from the observer. Whereas on the right, we would not see a net rotation measure because the uh, vector orientations all cancel each other out in this picture. Um, so just from synchrotron radiation, its polarization, and its rotation measure, we can glean quite a lot of information about the stre strength and structure uh, in, in principle in three dimensions of magnetic fields. So most of the rest of the talk will focus on these aspects, synchrotron polarization and rotation measure. Um, but I just wanted to highlight one um, radio tracer, which is very important, but I won't spend any more time talking about today, which is uh, Zeeman splitting. Uh, so in this case, what we're looking at is um, the splitting of, of transitions, um, let's say maser transitions, uh, split where the energy levels are split by, um, by ambient magnetic fields. Um, and those spectral lines that we would observe are, are split into two components, uh, which are left and right circularly polarized. And we can see this in circular polarization observations, either in absorption or emission of um, of these regions. Uh, this is really important because it probes in situ magnetic fields where the emission is generated, um, rather than um, the, for instance, Faraday rotation, which is really an, a, a, uh, an effect which is generated in the space between the emitting, emitting region and the observer. Um, so this is a very important uh, aspect of this measurement technique. And in particular, it gives us a tracer of the, um, the local magnetic conditions throughout the Milky Way. Um, so in this particular, this also is a, a, a tracer that is sensitive to the direction of the magnetic field. Um, on the left-hand side, what you're seeing is a map of the Milky Way with a bunch of um, observations that, that showed the, uh, the directionality of the magnetic field um, in different locations within the galaxy. Um, and these, um, are really crucial for helping us to establish the, um, the uh, magnetic field structure within the Milky Way. Um, measurements within the Milky Way from star forming regions like these, um, and also from the rotation measure uh, of pulsar um, radiation are, very, are really crucial for giving us local measurements of the magnetic field and, and telling us the, the structure and direction uh, of the magnetic field in the Milky Way, in particular reversals within the uh, within the galaxy. Okay, um, so with these tools, um, there's a, a few headline science areas that we want to uh, that we want to probe. I've broken them up into a couple of different um, areas. Firstly, um, cosmological areas. Um, as I mentioned before, we really want to understand how magnetic fields are structured within the, uh, the cosmic web and, um, and what relevance they have in, in driving the, uh, the structure of the universe. Um, so in particular, we'll, we're going to be looking with the square kilometer array at magnetic fields in very low density uh, environments with very weak magnetic fields um, below 
the micro Gauss level. Um, I should have mentioned before that in, in spiral galaxies, the typical magnetic field strength that we measure is one of order one to 10 micro Gauss. Um, so these are very weakly magnetized regions with very low electron uh, densities. Uh, so we'll be looking there for uh, filamentary structures between clusters and on even on larger scales, um, maybe magnetic fields in cosmic voids, and certainly in the circumgalactic medium of nearby galaxies, as I showed you previously. We're also really interested to find out how magnetic fields evolved um, with cosmic time, and um, thereby to constrain how magnetic fields were uh, were seeded in the first place. Um, so we can, uh, with the increasingly deep observations of the square kilometer array pathfinders and the SKA itself, um, we'll be looking at uh, the, these tracers of magnetic fields as a function of redshift uh, to be able to understand how these properties evolved um, throughout the, the course of cosmic time. And then finally, in this area, um, understanding how magnetic fields impacted the, um, the epoch of reionization which is one of the one of the really headline science goals of the square kilometer array, um, the epoch of ionization. Um, so we we understand from simulations that magnetic fields may have impacted um, the initial structures during the EOR uh, epoch itself, and in fact may have um, impacted how the, um, the how long the the EOR um, took to evolve um, from the uh, from the fully neutral state to the the ionized state that the universe is in now. And uh, on, the, on the flip side of that coin, um, the processes that took place during the EOR may actually have been crucial for seeding the, the intergalactic magnetic field. So coming back to the previous point about the evolution of magnetic fields with cosmic time, uh, the EOR um, and the conditions during the EOR may have been um, very important for uh, setting, the, um, setting the early conditions for, for cosmic magnetic fields. Beyond cosmology, uh, or on smaller scales, I guess I should say. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, we definitely want to look at the magnetic fields within galaxies, understand how magnetic fields are important for the properties and evolution of active galactic nuclei, star forming galaxies. Um, so we'll do this and I'll go into the details in a bit. Um, we want to look at well-resolved radio sources and, um, and star forming galaxies to understand those properties and evolution. Within our own Milky Way, uh, we uh, will be looking at the, um, the very detailed fine scale structure of magnetic fields and understanding how the, um, the ISM um, is, is um, driven by magnetic fields, is um, affected by magnetic fields and how, how star formation um, occurs within the Milky Way. And then finally, um, particularly by looking at uh, observations at the lowest radio frequencies with SKA low, uh, we really want to understand how depolarization, which is an effect that I won't go into into much detail, but um, depolarization is an effect that's driven by uh, typically by um, by unresolved structures in, in the magnetic field distribution, um, how those depolarization properties um, evolve as we go to increasingly lower frequencies. And then finally, um, things that I put in the so-called mystery um, area, uh, where these are, are um, evolving or em emerging um, science areas, which are um, becoming more, uh, more interesting for us now, given um, the way that things are um, being discovered in, in other fields of, of astronomy um, and our, our new applications, if you like, for, uh, for magnetic field research. One is, um, is uh, trying to understand the properties of, of dark matter, um, by looking at the annihilation of, of, uh, of WIMP dark matter. Uh, again, uh, basically the, the, the aim here would be to look at the um, synchrotron radiation emitted by, um, by particles resulting from the decay of, of dark matter. Um, those particles accelerating in magnetic fields and, um, and, and then being observable by the SKA. Um, so this would constrain the properties of the dark matter and also reveal weak magnetic fields, which may not otherwise be illuminated. Um, we'd also like to look at fast radio bursts for two reasons. First, to understand the environments of fast radio bursts and understand more about how they're, um, um, how they're generated. And also um, to use the, uh, the FRBs themselves as, um, as, um, as elements of a rotation measure grid, um, a concept which I'll come back to in a couple of slides here.
And then finally, just looking for um, previously unknown phenomena and, and sources. Um, so as we look increasingly deep with the square kilometer array, we expect to find um, unexpected sources. So hopefully you've gotten a sense that there's a very broad range of science areas that we aim to cover with, um, with magnetism. Um, we are definitely interested as a, as a group in, um, in magnetic fields for their own sake, but in particular, really trying to understand the, the role of magnetic fields in various other um, aspects of astrophysics and, and make sure that we understand the, the role of magnetic fields in all of these different processes. So I mentioned rotation measure grids um, a couple of times already. Um, so let me explain what that means. Um, this rotation measure grid concept is kind of our, um, our biggest tool in our toolkit um, for square kilometer array science. And the concept is, is the following. I mentioned before that um, polarized radio waves are rotated in a frequency dependent way by um, ionized regions that have magnetic fields along the line of sight. For instance, a cluster of galaxies as shown in the, the bottom of this plot here. Um, you can imagine, and we observe this all the time, um, that polarized light from a background radio galaxy passing through um, the intercluster medium, magnetized intercluster medium in a, in a galaxy cluster, will induce um, this Faraday rotation, which we then observe with the radio telescope. Um, that's a single rotation measure. The concept of a rotation measure grid is that we then, for a particular um, cluster, observe a bunch of background radio sources and look at the rotation measure of each of these background sources individually and look at them as a collection, um, which is what we call a rotation measure grid. Um, this collection of rotation measures for a given cluster uh, would help us to understand the structure and extent of magnetic fields in the, the foreground medium, this, uh, this cluster region here. The current state of the art for rotation measure grids um, has been produced by the very large array. Um, so this is um, the, uh, the rotation measure catalog that has been produced from the NVSS survey um, using uh, the VLA, as I said, uh, by Russ Taylor. Uh, it has a, a density of about one rotation measure per square degree. I'll come back to that number in a second. Um, we're now pushing these kinds of all sky polarization surveys to lower frequencies. Um, and this is the current state of the art for low frequencies around 150 megahertz, uh, where the red and blue points are from LOFAR, um, polarized sources detected with LOFAR. Uh, and the yellow and green ones are from the Murchison Wide Field Array in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, the benefit of these low frequency measurements is that our rotation measure precision is way higher than it is at higher, at sort of gigahertz frequencies. Typically the precision is about a hundred times higher, uh, which gives us access with these low frequency observations to very weak magnetic fields that would be hidden in the noise for higher frequency observations. So the, from the, for the high and low frequency uh, rotation measure grids that have been developed to date, as I said, typically the density is about one rotation measure per square degree or at lower frequencies, it's even lower. It's only um, say around 0.5 rotation measures per square degree. Um, thinking of this in terms of linear scales in the context of a rotation measure grid, this would only give us less than one rotation measure per one background rotation measure per giant radio galaxy um, beyond the distance of 40 megaparsec. So it's really only for the very largest sources at the very nearest distances where we can currently observe more than one rotation measure per foreground object and therefore have some leverage through rotation measure analysis on the, uh, on the magnetic field structure of the foreground objects. And so typically this, this approach is used most successfully at the minute um, for again, very large nearby objects and in particular the Milky Way um, where things are, are really very close and can be very large on the sky. And we clearly want to increase the density of these rotation measure grids to be able to look at um, smaller and smaller sources at larger and larger distances. So with the square kilometer array and the pathfinders, um, we're looking increasingly towards rotation measure grids over a broad range of frequency, really ultimately going from 50 megahertz all the way up to 15 gigahertz. And I'll just mention a couple of things about the, the pros and cons of these different frequency ranges. As I mentioned before, at the, at the lowest frequencies, we have extremely high precision to rotation measures. And that gives us very sensitive leverage on weak magnetic fields along the line of sight. Uh, at the highest frequencies, 
um, we can expect to have very dense coverage of rotation measures. Um, and this will allow us to illuminate um, really multi-scale magnetic fields for intervening objects. Again, for instance, clusters, uh, nearby galaxies, and the cosmic web itself. And in the middle, and in fact, across all frequencies, um, we have access to this depolarization property that I mentioned before. Um, again, I won't go into the, de into the, into the gory details here, but um, this depolarization effect, which has strong frequency dependence, gives us very um, uh, strong leverage on the, the detailed mag magnetized structure within the, uh, within the objects that we're studying. So we um, are, are already tackling these issues now, and we increasingly are going to be pushing towards this full frequency coverage with the square kilometer itself. Um, I wanted to focus now on a particular science area, which is around uh, galaxy clusters and filaments. Um, so here we have, uh, in very recent years with, with LOFAR, um, we've started to detect the, the signs, direct detections of the uh, filaments connecting galaxy clusters. These, these um, are really the very first um, direct detections of synchrotron emission from the cosmic web. These are really remarkable discoveries um, with, with LOFAR. Um, and so in, in two cases here, we have uh, two cluster pairs on linear scales of two to three megaparsec, um, at least in projection. The, the case on the left may actually have quite a larger separation, but in projected distance, it's about three megaparsec. Um, we can start now with, with the very sensitive um, LOFAR observations uh, to pick up this very steep spectrum, low surface brightness um, synchrotron emission in, uh, from, from the filament connecting these, uh, these clusters. Now, these are sort of unique galaxy cluster pairs because they're relatively close together. They're, they're, um, there's some merger activity going on here. So these are uh, in particularly um, special conditions, let's say. Um, there's a, a, a very recent result, um, which is using stacking for uh, hundreds of thousands of, of galaxy cluster pairs um, to find the, the very weak um, low surface brightness average uh, synchrotron emission from between cluster pairs. Uh, this has been, been done with a, a stacking analysis led by Tessa Vernstrom um, here at CSIRO. Um, this is using, uh, in this particular uh, image here is, is using the, um, the GLEAM survey from the Murchison Wide Field Array. Um, and from a, a detailed stacking analysis, um, what we've wound up with is um, a residual signal um, between the, the whole sample of, of cluster pairs. We have a very weak detection of um, synchrotron emission from the filaments connecting those clusters on scales larger than around three megaparsec. Um, that emission has a, a spectral index of around minus one, so steep, but not, not super steep. And uh, we infer a magnetic field strength, typical magnetic field strength of around 30 to 60 nanogauss, so very weak magnetic fields uh, in, the, in the, these filaments. The middle panel here just shows an, a, a detection, uh, sorry, a null detection. Um, so repeating the same procedure for uh, clusters that are not associated with each other. So we can see that in those cases, there is, as expected, no detection of filaments. Those are clusters which are not related to each other. Now on the right, we have a, a, uh, a simulation of, of different uh, cluster pairs, uh, the synchrotron emission that we would expect to be coming from different cluster pairs. And on the basis of the comparison between this detection with the model, uh, we can infer um, that the detected structures are quite a bit brighter um, than would be predicted by the simulation. Not outrageously so, but high enough, uh, sorry, um, bright, bright enough in comparison that we can assume that the, um, the simulation should really have assumed a, a higher value for the seed magnetic field or a higher efficiency of the shocks that are, are um, uh, amplifying those magnetic fields. Uh, sorry, accelerating the, uh, the electrons, the cosmic, ray, the cosmic ray electrons. Now, in a very complementary analysis, this is using LOFAR, um, we can look at the rotation measures of individual sources. Again, because of this very high precision in rotation measure, we can find rotation measure differences even in individual radio galaxies. And we can see uh, statistically significant differences in rotation measure between, for instance, two lobes of an FR2 source like this one, uh, very small rotation measure differences, which are statistically reliable. and in this particular case, 
give us a constraint um, on the magnetic field strength um, in these filaments, these overlapping filaments of around one to 10 nanogauss. Now the difference in magnetic field strength is notable here. Uh, from this synchrotron detection, we infer a magnetic field strength of around 30 to 60 nanogauss, whereas from Faraday rotation, um, we infer a magnetic field strength, which is considerably smaller. And the way that we've interpreted that uh, is that the magnetic fields in the filaments are only partially ordered, uh, that the magnetic fields in the filaments must have uh, a substantial degree of tangling or, or magnetic field reversals. As I mentioned before at the beginning, the uh, rotation measure technique is highly sensitive to the degree of order in the magnetic field along the line of sight. So we, we suggest that the magnetic field in these filaments is only about 10% ordered, give or take. Now, coming to the, the emergence now of the densest rotation measure grids, which are currently available, um, I'd like to present this recent result from ASCAP. So this is the first rotation measure grid result from the POSSUM survey. Um, and that is uh, a rotation measure grid analysis of the Fornax cluster. Um, with the observations here, so this is the, um, the distribution of, of polarized sources over the 30 square degree single pointing field of view of the ASCAP telescope. Uh, part of the field of view is missing due to some data um, processing issues. Uh, but anyway, across the field of view, we have um, a, a very high um, polarized source density, typically around 25 or so rotation measures per square degree. So that's about 25 times denser coverage than with the NVSS survey that I showed you previously. With these observations, we were able to show um, that relative to the, the cluster center, which is around here, um, the rotation measures show a much higher dispersion close to the center of the cluster than in the field um, surrounding the, the cluster itself. The extent of that, of that region where the rotation measures is higher um, shows us that there is an ionized intercluster medium in the Fornax cluster, which extends out to two to four times the, um, the region which is illuminated by X-rays, uh, but still sort of less than or comparable to the, the virial radius of the cluster itself. And a total mass of ionized gas of around three times what would you what you would infer from the X-rays alone, around 10 to the 11 solar masses of ionized gas mass. So this is a very sensitive technique for finding ionized gas in the intercluster medium of, of galaxies. Uh, sorry, galaxy, galaxy clusters um, should be as well for galaxies, uh, as well as um, inferring that there are magnetic fields present as well, of course. And just as a as a bonus. Um, uh, that's one extra plot, which I'll skip. Um, but uh, as a bonus, there's also an indication through the rotation measures that there's a bow shock structure here in a, in uh, arising from the subcluster merger within the Fornax cluster. Um, I won't go into the details here, but basically the, um, the red and blue areas here uh, indicate the local um, rotation measure signal that we're detecting. And what we think is that there's a, a bow shock region here um, in the um, associated again with the subcluster merger, as well as a uh, a, a region behind the uh, behind this bow shock where where the where the rotation measures are far less ordered, uh, indicative of a more turbulent structure than in the bow shock region itself. So all of this is uh, presented in a recent paper by Craig Anderson et al. Uh, again using the the ASCAP radio telescope. Um, now, a few words about uh, nearby galaxies. Um, we've gone now from filaments through clusters now to individual galaxies. Um, this is a, a collage of, of individual um, galaxies that were observed as a part of the Westerbork Sings project that I worked on um, a surprising number of years ago. Um, and you can see here the, the ordered magnetic field structure in a number of different um, grand design spiral galaxies that were observed first as, the, as part of the SINGS project and then later as um, elements of the Westerbork SINGS project. Um, this, one of the interesting things that, are, that, came out from the, um, that came out from this survey is that we, we tend to find in a lot of spiral galaxies regions uh, like this one here, which do not show polarization. You can see throughout the, the remainder of this of the disk of this galaxy, NGC 6946, you can see polarization indicated here with, um, with linear polarization vectors, or magnetic field vectors, actually. You can see linear polarization throughout most of the disk, except for in this quadrant here. Again, in this 
other galaxy M100, you can see uh, a region of the galaxy which is unpolarized as well. And what we think is that um, it, it turned out actually that these unpolarized regions are always aligned with, um, strangely um, to our view, um, were always aligned with the approaching side. If you looked at the, the gas distribution, the gas kinematics, the unpolarized regions always are associated with the approaching side of the galaxy, which really puzzled us. Um, but we ultimately determined that what this is showing us is that we're seeing just the near side layer of the magnetic fields in these galaxies um, and a particular magnetic field orientation, um, which is aligned with the, the sense of the, of the rotation of the galaxy um, is giving us this preferential um, polarization versus no polarization on one side across to the other. Um, now that was a relatively narrow band um, analysis um, by today's standards. And what we're doing now is trying to push that um, to, again, a much broader frequency coverage, um, which uh, results in uh, being able to look at the magnetic field at various depths within the galaxy and to be able to unpick ultimately the three-dimensional structure of magnetic fields and galaxies. So an example of this is um, of that same galaxy um, that I just mentioned, this one here, NGC 6946, where we supplemented uh, Westerbork and Effelsberg data with new Westerbork observations uh, at 13 centimeter and use that analysis um, to, uh, again, to unpick, to start to unpick the, the three-dimensional um, magnetic field properties within, within the galaxy. Ultimately, this kind of analysis will be done in far further detail, much better frequency coverage, much better sensitivity and angular resolution with the square kilometer array, especially the mid component of the square kilometer array to really help us constrain depolarization properties within these galaxies and to help us uncover the three-dimensional magnetic field properties. So in the case of this particular analysis, what we were able to do was to distinguish between different, um, different depolarization models uh, again, I, I don't want to go into the details here, but uh, the, the different colors here indicate different models of depolarization, which are the best fit um, within the galaxy, with, throughout the galaxy, and give us a sense for, you know, to what extent the depolarization is arising from a foreground screen of depolarizing material uh, versus a, um, a regular magnetic field within the resolution element of the telescope. A, a byproduct of, of this uh, modeling analysis is that we can uncover the intrinsic um, magnetic field orientation in the plane of the galaxy throughout the galaxy, including in the regions where the polarization is not detected at the lower frequencies. Ultimately, this kind of analysis gives us um, a view of the, uh, the different components, the different vertical components of the, uh, of the um, the gas distribution and the magnetic field distribution throughout the galaxy. Um, at the lower frequencies, 20 centimeter emission is really only arising from the thick disk and um, impacted by the halo region. <clears throat> at the intermediate frequencies, we're looking further down into the, into the thermal thick disk region um, and out towards the observer. And at the higher frequencies, at around three or six centimeters, we're looking really down into the star forming regions of the galaxy and uh, seeing that emission propagate all the way to the observer. So it's with this sort of un onion slice view of galaxies across a broad frequency range that we can really understand, again, the three-dimensional structure of galaxies like this one. I'll mention also um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the observations that we undertook with the VLA. This is, again, the, the changes survey that I mentioned previously, uh, together with um, the LOFAR radio telescope of the same galaxy um, to obtain very sensitive, uh, sorry, very high precision um, uh, information about the spectral index distribution across the galaxy um, and to constrain the, um, the, vertical, uh, the vertical distribution of magnetic fields. Um, because of time, I think I'll, I'll skip a, a few of the details that I intended to mention and just mention that uh, what we have been able to do is to match a model of the, uh, of the, the cosmic ray wind or the, the wind traced by cosmic rays uh, in the extraplanar regions here. And we've been able to, um, to um, suggest a few things about this galaxy. First of all, um, we think that because this wind is expanding as it moves outwards from the disk, 
we think that it might be contributing to the overall kinematics of the galaxy as well. Um, and this um, lag in rotation, which is observed commonly across a number of different spiral galaxies. Uh, we infer a mass loss rate from this wind flow, this wind process of around three to six solar masses per year. Um, but then we, we still are left with some future work that is relevant for the SKA era, um, including improving the modeling and really trying to get a better handle on the morphology um, of the uh, synchrotron emission that's predicted by a wind model like this one and how it compares to our observations. So there's quite a lot of um, work to be done in this area with a combination in this case of observations from SK low and SK mid. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, Meerkat as well as a, as a very important uh, pathfinder on the way to the SK. I debated whether to show this image or not because um, it's actually not a great example of the fantastic image quality which is possible with Meerkat. Um, this is a, a radio continuum uh, image which was made as a quick look image um, from uh, data associated with the Meerkat Mongoose project, which will look at very deep H1 observations of 30 uh, nearby spiral galaxies. We're also um, determining magnetic field information from that same uh, galaxy sample. Uh, this image, again, it was quick look, so really is, it, you know, the image quality here, I think, to me, looks great, um, but is is definitely, um, you know, impacted by artifacts around bright sources. That is not indicative of the image quality achievable with Meerkat. We'll definitely be able to do better than this with, um, with uh, more features in the pipeline. But what I wanted to show is that we'll have very detailed um, structural information about the magnetic fields in the same galaxies where we're looking at the H1 uh, through the Mongoose project with uh, with Meerkat. So there are indeed quite a lot of telescopes which are currently doing um, SK precursor science, um, everything from LOFAR through Meerkat to uh, to ASCAP and and more, uh, and this is all leading towards the towards the SKA. Um, each of these different projects and the SK itself will um, will produce rotation measure grids that are increasingly sensitive. Um, covering more and more sky area. So here in this plot, it's a bunch of different polarization surveys uh, where further to the right shows a rotation measure grid over a wider area of sky and points further to the top are rotation measure grids, which are denser. Um, so really the best survey will ultimately be delivered by SKA mid, which will be over 30,000 square degrees um, and will give us a very dense coverage of rotation measures. So I just wanted to say a couple of words about the SKA itself. Um, and um, the um, SKA will come in two telescopes, low and mid. Uh, low will um, comprise 130,000 low frequency antennas, uh, will give us sort of five to 25 arc second resolution and a reason, uh, quite good sensitivity compared to current facilities. SKA mid will give us arc second to sub arc second resolution with extremely high sensitivity. And these two, uh, two telescopes are located in Western Australia, will be located in Western Australia and South Africa respectively. The way that the rotation measure grid um, picture will evolve is to go from the current state of the art, as I mentioned before here, um, with a hole in the Southern hemisphere down here, that situation will completely change uh, when we add the square kilometer array. This is what we expect the rotation measure grid to look like with the with the square kilometer array, giving us a typical um, density of around 60 to 90 rotation measures per square degree, which is almost two orders of magnitude improvement over the current state of the art. And lots of rotation measures behind individual, individual objects like galaxies so that we can really study the magnetic field properties of these foreground objects. Now we also want to go to low frequencies as well. I'll move past this quickly so I can end uh, soon. Um, we're also using um, uh, learnings from current low frequency telescopes to, uh, to show us what we can do with SKA low, uh, and in particular to undertake deep surveys with SKA low, um, where we'll be working in polarization well below the confusion limit for total intensity. Um, we expect to go um, we could go, with given enough telescope time, we could go 400 times deeper in polarization with SK low than we would be able to do with total intensity. This is because of classical confusion. Um, the source, the sky being so full 
at this frequency and resolution and total intensity, we can go much better in polarization and achieve very dense and very um, high precision rotation measure grids with SKLO. So we're anticipating, um, we're considering different survey setups with SKLO. Um, we expect ultimately probably not to undertake a wide all sky 30,000 square degree survey with, with SKLO. And the reason for that is that the antennas are very highly directional um, and we don't actually want to undertake observations probably that would be pointing down towards the horizon. We probably tend towards a medium depth, medium sky area tier with quite sensitive observations over about 10,000 square degrees and perhaps also a deep tier, deep stare in a small region of sky uh, to look for unique sources and uh, to look for um, faint, uh, faint galaxies as well. So on this grid that I showed before, we would expect um, the, those different wedding cake tiers for SKLO to fall in, this, in these particular regions uh, to give us really excellent rotation measure grids with very high precision in rotation measure. I'm gonna skip this slide. Uh, we think that uh, such an SKLO survey would be very commensal with other science areas. Um, and one that I highlighted here in the graphics is the, the prospect for using VLBI um, to resolve magnetic structures within galaxies, which we would only see in a very um, zoomed out fashion, if you like, with, um, with SK low and SK mid themselves. Okay, now um, I had some words to say about data rates, which I will not um, mention because of time, but I'll just mention that uh, you know, these, these projects require a huge amount of data um, and, and place demands on our requirements for SK regional centers. We'll be collecting a huge amount of data and producing a lot of data, uh, which is why we're going to undertake a science data challenge, which will um, allow us to practice these techniques and understand exactly what requirements we have for, um, for regional center resources and techniques. And with all of this, we're leading towards our uh, refining our plans for the square kilometer array. Um, so with apologies for going slightly over time, I'd like to say thanks for your attention. Um, and I'd like to invite you, if you're interested in joining the Magnetism Science Working Group, um, I'd like to invite you to get in touch with me by email. And we'd be very happy to, um, to have your, uh, have your um, contributions to the, the Magnetism Science Working Group. So thanks once again for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, George, for this uh, talk. And then uh, we can open the talk for questions. Uh, please raise your hand for doing the question. And I will pass the word to Javier. Javier, please, uh, you will manage the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, George, for the, the talk and the broad view of all the things that are, are going on with, with polarization in the interferometry world. So I don't see any hand raised now and the chat also. Okay, uh, yeah, Isabel has a question. Yep. So for, first of all, thank you very much, George. It's been extremely interesting. Um, I had a question. It's a um, more a technical question, in fact, uh, concerning the clusters when you when you collapse, I mean, when you when you do the stacking, uh, because you, you consider cluster pairs, right? So um, I guess that you consider some the, the positions of the clusters in order to first align them and then stack, or what, 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 I guess you, you you do some 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 of of the sort of the sort, right? Yeah, that's right. So there's, there's a few things to mention there. I um, I think I did indeed cover quite a lot of ground, and at the expense of a lot of the detail for some of these individual projects. Um, for that for that one in particular, um, we as I mentioned, we stacked on over 100,000 uh, cluster pairs. But if you're a, somebody who works in the, in the field of galaxy clusters, you'll know that there's not, um, we don't actually know that many clusters. Um, so what we did instead was we actually stacked on the positions of um, red luminous galaxies, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, luminous red galaxies, uh, which are signposts for the presence of, of clusters and should be near the centers of those clusters. Um, and we did some, some techniques to, um, to subtract out the average contribution from uh, the cluster halos themselves. Um, so in other words, we expect you know, uh, emission from 
uh, from the, the component galaxies within the clusters, as well as the cluster halos um, themselves. Um, so we subtracted those out in an averaged way um, to, to lead to just the, um, the residual contribution, which we interpret as being from the filaments. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I think the what I wanted to say was twofold. First, we're, we're actually stacking on the locations of these LRGs, luminous red galaxies, as signposts of the clusters, and indeed subtracting out somehow the contribution from the clusters to reveal just the filament contribution. Mm. Okay, because at, at that respect, we're, we, we are working on, on a project trying to, I mean, to detect and to trace filaments from, from the optical point of view. Uh, so, um, so it could be interesting to see whereas there's a, a way of stacking considering such kind of filaments that we, we already know that they are there from the optical point of view in, the, in terms of densities of galaxies, mm -hmm. uh, not, not only the, uh, the red cluster galaxies or the, or the BCG when you, when you know where, where it is. So it, uh, I, I find it extremely interesting to, um, to get into the details and, and, I mean, and have uh, the possibility of, of, of using the uh, optical information in the sense of the density of galaxies, tracing filaments and, and, and do a similar stacking, but now knowing where the filaments are. Mm, yeah, that would be really interesting. Um, I'm going to uh, just go back to the relevant slide here um, so that um, you can see the, um, the surname. So that if you um, search, this is a very recently accepted paper by yeah. uh, Tessa Vernstrom at all. Uh, I've, where the, I've taken where the... a snapshot of the-, of the... Oh, great. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> of the slide. Um, yeah. Okay, I, Maybe you. I'll mention as well that, you know, there's potentially, and we, we say this in the paper, that there's potentially also a contribution from, from galaxies along the filaments uh, in this region as well. Um, something which would, I think, if I'm not mistaken, be much clearer in the optical uh, than it would be in this case. Um, but uh, we, we think that the, the contribution from, from galaxies along the filaments is not sufficient to, um, to provide the signal strength. It must be, we think, coming from the diffuse component from the, the filament itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so in, in that sense, it should be, I, I guess, more useful to, to try to, to stack along the filament when you know where it is, right? I think that's, I think that's right. Yep. Okay, thank you. Very sure. interesting. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you, Isabel, for the question. Uh, Lourdes, uh, you have a comment or question? Yes, well, um, also I, I joined Isabel on thanking you about the talk and the contents because it was very, I think, with a high dynamic range of information <laughs> from, uh, from a very general perspective to, to the hot topics uh, to come. I, I wanted to ask you two things. One was if you could expand a bit on a concept that I realize is not so, not everybody's familiar with, which is the concept of commensality. And if you could um, put um, some example on commensality between, I'm going to, to, <laughs> to go to my stuff here, uh, between in the study of uh, galaxy evolution, combining magnetic fields and, and H1. That was one question and maybe continue, I don't know, uh, the way you want to answer this. A co complementary question is about uh, what, um, because um, there is a good fraction of the Institute working on galaxy evolution, but not from the radio point of view. What do you think is the best complementary um, kind of uh, study at other wavelengths to complement uh, the study of magnetic fields that uh, are coming with the SKA? And the last one, uh, and I, I say all together, is uh, if you want to go at the end uh, uh, to this slide about the computing computational requirements, I think it's going to be interesting from, for some of the people in the audience because of the developments of the regional center here. So yeah, that's it. Indeed, uh, thanks, Lourdes. And I, I wanted to actually mention that I, you know, I included some of these topics, you know, knowing that there were that there were areas of interest within the institute there. Um, and I, I'm sorry that I I put too much content, so I had to rush through the very end there. But uh, I'm happy to say a few words here. Um, so, yeah, I think the commensality really, I, indeed, I should define that. So, commensality is a, a word that we've been using increasingly within the square kilometer array community um, to reflect the fact that. Our ambitions for using the square kilometer array um, are are really huge, and if you added up the 
the amount of, of survey time um, on the telescope, which was proposed some years ago, uh, it's gigantic. It's decades, um, you know, whereas the observational program will have to be considerably shorter. And so we'll need to do um, observations which serve multiple science aims at the same time. And that's this word commensality refers to the idea of undertaking observations that serve multiple science topics simultaneously. Uh, so when it comes to um, doing magnetism observations that are commensal with, uh, for instance, um, H1 observations of galaxies, I think one of the areas um, that I would refer to is um, the point that I made that um, the polarization properties of galaxies at sort of gigahertz frequencies um, tends to be quite aligned with the gas kinematics. And the reason for that is because we think that the, the particular magnetic field structure that galaxies tend to exhibit is in fact um, connected to the, the structure and rotational sense of, of the galaxies. Um, that the magnetic field not only follows the spiral arms, the spiral arm pattern, but in fact in the magnetic field as well as the, the distribution of the galaxy itself, exhibits trailing arms as well. And that's the key, uh, we think, for that for that observed pattern. Um, so um, extending this to additional uh, to an additional sample of galaxies beyond the handful that we currently have, I think will be very important to understand the, the overall structure kinematics and magnetic field structure of, of galaxies as a piece. In terms of the optical contributions, I think that the um, the ionized gas distribution is extremely important. Um, the, the star forming properties within the galaxies as well, um, both because it's the those are the locations where the um, the cosmic rays that illuminate the magnetic fields are generated in supernova shocks. Um, but also the ionized gas distribution is very important because it's related to the uh, rotation measure pattern that we find uh, in the polarization observations of these galaxies. So I'm, I'm really really keen to see um, observations of the ionized gas component within within the galaxies that we'll be studying in polarization. Um, then about the, the data centers, um, I guess I, I'll, I'll highlight that um, we have, um, which we have requirements which go beyond the standard radio continuum analysis um, because we're looking at these, at the, the frequency variation of polarization properties we need uh, what are what we tend to call continuum cubes. So they're um, not just um, broadband images, but uh, but cubes that have a pretty coarse frequency resolution, typically around say a megahertz resolution at gigahertz frequencies. Um, so definitely not as high spectral resolution as as for H1 observations, but with some spectral resolution. Um, we need so we need to have three dimensional quantities here to produce ultimately what are called Faraday cubes, where we have um, uh, cubes which have uh, RA and DEC as the first two axes as normal, and the third axis becomes effectively rotation measure. Um, and as I, I put on this slide, um, for, the, for the particular example of the possum survey, that winds up for a 30,000 square degree um, survey with ASCAP just from the single beam images, we end up with about two petabytes of, of data required. Uh, and then on top of this, we make mosaics and, and um, higher order um, science data products as well. So there's a, a, a bunch of different unique techniques um, that are required, as well as large data requirements as well. And all of this needs to be fed into the requirements for the, um, for the regional centers that will be um, that will be uh, created in, in the coming years in, uh, well, across the world in Europe and, uh, and everywhere else. And is there any particular visualization tool that you use mm -hmm. for uh, magnetic fields polarization? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and <laughs> yeah, people get pretty, uh, uh, pretty religious about these things as well, I think. Um, I, I've actually, I've been noticing recently that um, CARTA has been extremely powerful um, for for doing polarization for visualizing um, polarization quantities. Um, previous to that, a lot of people that I know used KVIS, which is um, which is extremely difficult to use nowadays with with such large data products that we have now. Um, but again, CARTA I think has has proven to be really useful for for polarization data. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, is there any other question from the audience?
or any comment? Um, okay. If not, I may may also make a quick question. So oh, most of the science you've shown has been possible because the new instrumentation gets wider fields of view, much, sensi much more sensitivity, of course, and also uh, better resolution, for example, to get these RM pointings at the grid mm. uh, that you are getting. So, and now you mentioned also that uh, some uh, frequency resolution is important, although, of course, not going so uh, to so small bandwidth in channels, channel width. So what would you say uh, to a study <clears throat> in the nearby universe, nearby galaxies, to start studying different components within those galaxies, like, mm. uh, like a star forming regions or maybe the AGN contribution and the environment around the AGN, uh, all these, um, or, or even all other transient events, or I don't know, even pulsars in, in other galaxies, maybe. Uh, what would you say would be the most relevant improvement? would be sensitivity or it's a combination of sensitivity and angular resolution or, or I guess the total bandwidth is also a key a key factor so could you comment on that and how what would what would be the big change from SKJ precursors to the SKJ regarding these all these variables mm -hmm. yeah that's a really good question um, I think like like any good astronomy answer, um, the answer is we want everything. Um, <laughs> uh, I think the, probably the biggest driver is, is sensitivity, I think. Um, and uh, sorry, I'm, uh, there's a lot of a lot of factors to answering that question, I think. Uh, but sensitivity is the is the primary driver, I think. Resolution is also key, as you mentioned before. Um, I think it's particularly important for the low frequencies. So observations with SK low resolution is, is particularly important because um, these depolarization effects, which I mentioned but skipped over the details, um, depolarization effects at low frequencies um, can prohibit detection of many polarized sources if you don't have um, sort of arc second angular resolution. Um, and we know this from, from low frequency observations that have been done with MWA and LOFAR. Um, yeah, uh, certainly the, the frequency coverage is very important as well. And so I guess I would, I would say that the following considerations are important. Sensitivity is important um, for both SK low and mid um, to give us a higher density of rotation measures across the sky. Angular resolution is very important, particularly for for low frequency for SKA low, and the frequency coverage is really essential everywhere, um, both to um, be able to probe this depolarization effect, as well as to give very high precision on these rotation measures, because the precision on rotation measures gives you immediately access to increasingly weaker magnetic fields along the line of sight. Okay. Well, apologies for the question that was not very precise. It was very broad, but I think it's good to have your yeah, good. your your ideas on on these things in, in a general way, also. Okay. I of course, as it. as I said before, we're basically very greedy. We just want everything to be better. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. I don't see any other questions or comments in the chat or in the in the list of participants. So I think we can finish now. Uh, if that's fine, Rene. Yeah. Fine. Uh, I think uh, it's time to to end the talk. Thank you very much, George. And I may say that this is the last uh, colloquium of uh, this part of the year. Now we enter in a, in a, um, in holidays, so until September we will have non uh, talks. Thank you very much for this contribution, and thank you all for being here for the talk and uh, having this uh, question and answer session. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, George. Thanks.